the topic of today is the topic of smoothing. When we're talking about smoothing, we are talking also about things like normals, so vertex normals, which uh, will also bring us to talk about things like soft edges, hard edges, um, explicit normals. And uh, the topic of smoothing is very intimately related to uh, the simple concept of a normal map. So what is a normal map exactly? Now, this isn't a math class, okay? We're not gonna go that deep within the knowledge there, but we'll certainly talk enough about a normal map from a more mathematical sense in a way, uh, so that you can really understand why is it that the colors that we have uh, are part of a normal map? Where do these colors come from? If this is something that you've literally never seen before, uh, or never been exposed to as a topic, it's gonna be very interesting for you, okay? Um, we'll spend a lot of time looking at cubes and looking at spheres and looking at very basic normal maps, but uh, I will explain things in a way that you may not have been uh, exposed to before. So if you're not really familiar with this particular uh, topic, I certainly suggest that you stick around, even if uh, it seems as if we will be uh, looking at very basic uh, models there. There is a lot to talk about, and I wanna delve right deep into that. So let's get started. Okay, so as you can see, this is a very basic scene that I have here. So this scene is in Marmset 4, and we'll spend quite a lot of time to really just go through it and really um, look at these different spheres and cubes because they're all actually very different. So I have two spheres on either side and I have three cubes in the middle there. Um, and at first glance, they all kind of look the same, uh, but truth be told, these three cubes that you're looking at right now are uh, as different as they possibly could be in terms of topology, but more importantly, in terms of smoothing. Um, and because they all have different smoothing, it creates uh, different artifacts, perhaps, uh, for a normal map that is applied on it, but it, it, it creates different complications in certain instances there. So. Uh, perhaps just as a small teaser there, right? If I take this particular cube here and I just look at it here, you can, you can see how the light really reacts with the surface there. And you can see how the surface, how all of the faces of the cube are all nice and flat. But the moment that I actually zoom in there and uh, we really start to look at the specular, the way that the specular really intimately reacts with the surface there, you can probably start seeing that, that there's a lot of little artifacts that are there. The surface isn't actually smooth. There's this kind of moiré pattern, this kind of like, almost like a little bit like carbon fiber um, pattern that kind of appears there. It kind of, that's kind of what it reminds me. The surface is supposed to be completely, completely flat and not have any sort of artifacts. So already here, there's something that's very interesting to talk about, of course. The second cube that we have here, take a look at the highlight, take a look at how clean the surface is, how this highlight reacts with the surface. These two cubes, as you can see from this particular distance, they all react exactly the same way as far as the light is concerned. But the moment that I actually zoom into this second cube here, you can see that now that the, the differences become very obvious. I don't have any of that kind of little carbon fiber-ish sort of pattern that I had that was appearing on the surface there that are simply artifacts. Uh, on as we had on the previous cube there. If you do just a uh, back and forth here, you can see that it's very, very obvious there. Now, although the surface looks a lot nicer uh, and we have gotten rid of all these artifacts that we have seen on the previous cube, this cube isn't artifact free, as you can see. If we actually look at the border there, we can see that the borders here, there's this kind of black streak that seems to be connecting uh, the different vertices there. There are certainly some issues there with the baking, the highlight here is kind of broken in half. It's not continuous there. Whereas it didn't have that problem on the first cube, right? So, uh-huh, already there, you're like, yeah, cube number two is like, is so much better because look at the highlight, it looks so good. I don't know what's going on there, but definitely it's good. And I know that you'll tell me later on, Laura, what's going on. Yes, of course I will. Uh, I just wanna tease you all before we actually get into that. You can see that actually, uh, Maybe it's not so great after all. Uh, there are other problems here that are uh, interesting to point out to you. Uh, and uh, certainly whatever I have done here uh, is simply also not the best solution possible. And now enter cube number three. And what's happening on cube number three? 
cube number three does not have any of those artifacts that we have seen on cube number one. First of all, none of these artifacts are there anymore. And second of all, none of those black streaks that we had on cube number two are there anymore. So we have both. Uh, we have essentially what looks like the most perfect bake ever of a high risk cube over a low risk cube that you could ever imagine. Now for these spheres, well, they're simply two spheres that simply wish that they were cubes. Uh, that's pretty much how it goes there. Let's look at this particular scene within Maya then. And I think what's going on may start to become a lot more obvious to a lot of you. So these are the same primitives that we had within Marmoset there. And so we have uh, our two spheres at both extremities. And in the middle here, we have our three cubes. Now, although they all looked very similar within Marmoset, they all looked like they were exactly the same. When we look at these cubes here, and especially if we look at these cubes without having a normal map applied within Maya, now these three cubes look completely different. So these three cubes with the normal map applied all look exactly the same, as long as we don't start paying attention to the details there, as we have done. But when we look at the low res without the normal map, you can see how completely different they actually look there. So let's really talk about these different primitives in the context of smoothing. What is happening smoothing-wise on these different geometries that we have? And let's start with this uh, particular sphere that we have here, since uh, it is the one that is on the left there. So this is a very standard, basic Maya sphere. There's really nothing. I haven't tweaked this particular sphere in any sort of way. I haven't changed anything there. Uh, and um, what is interesting is that by default, this sphere is simply completely smooth. And when we're talking about smoothing in a context of a low res, what we really mean is uh, whether the surface looks like it is perfectly continuous. Can we have the light react with the surface in a way that we can't easily see the separation between the polygons there? When you have a surface where uh, you cannot tell where the polygons are, there's no harsh edges that are particularly visible, everything looks like it's one continuous surface, then that surface is a smooth surface. Whereas when you have a surface, let's say like this particular cube that's here, right, where uh, the borders between uh, some of the polygons, if not all of the polygons, uh, is very harsh and very, very easy to spot, then you have a surface that is not smooth, or uh, a surface that is hard, um, I suppose. This is a cube that has been completely smoothed. And what becomes very, very interesting, okay, is that if we look at the way that the light reacts with the surface, right, we can follow the specular highlight around. It seems to be always pointing towards the camera. And that's actually what was happening on this sphere as well. In both cases, the highlight is facing towards the camera. This is a cube where all the edges have been softened. So in a way, this cube is actually a very, very basic, very low res sphere, if you kind of think about it, okay? Uh, since everything has been smoothed and this is essentially what it looks like, uh, just a, a very low res version of it. So what's interesting here to point out, okay, is that um, for me, there's really two different things, when we think of a low res, of a surface of a low res, okay, there's really two uh, things that are uh, very interrelated, but that at the same time are actually different things. And that is for me the concept of the geometry, the polygy, if you will, um, or just the geometry of a particular low res. And, it, and the geometry itself would be essentially all the polygons, and vertices and the edges there. So if we talk about this particular object here in the context of its geometry, we're really talking about a cube. This is what it is. It's a cube, you know, like it's quite obvious to us. There's six sides and all the sides all have the same size, uh, all have the same, all the sides have the same size. And so this is obviously a cube, right? Uh, so in the context of its geometry, this is a cube, but in the context of its surface, in the context of its surface or its surfacing, or you can kind of call that in whichever way uh, um, around that as a term there, uh, this is not a cube, this is a sphere. 
So that's kind of interesting. This object is both a cube and both a sphere, uh, but it is a cube and a sphere in different contexts. It's geometrically a cube, but in terms of its surfacing, right now it is more akin to a sphere. I guess you could, uh, you know, if you wanted to sort of think about it in a different way, perhaps. I could take all of these edges that are here, I could harden all of these here, and now this is still a cube from a geometry standpoint, but the way that the light reacts with the surface as I rotate my camera around here, you could say this is more akin to a cylinder now. The surfacing is more akin to a cylinder than it is akin to a cube. And that is very, very important when we start talking about things like normal maps. Um, and certainly there's a lot of implications when it comes to creating a LORES uh, regarding all of this. Let's talk about the normals then. So the word normal really comes from these little things that are kind of sticking out. And what these things that are there that are sticking out is uh, simply the direction, if you will. Um, now, if anyone here is a programmer, you will probably be uh, will probably be appalled by how I will describe the normals within the class there. Um, but still, these uh, I think for a lot of people, I think this will be quite useful there. So you can sort of imagine the normal as the direction at which the vertex is looking, if you see what I mean. So the normal is simply the direction uh, in which the vertex is pointing to. Essentially, every vertex has a normal, uh, although a vertex can have multiple normals. Um, now, here again, maybe programmer friends would be uh, would sort of disagree with that, and we'll get into the reasons why. Um, but for us artists, it really helps to think about the fact that a vertex can have more than one normal, but it has to have at least one. Uh, since essentially the normal that we have here per vertex is in a way the average of the direction in which all of the polygons around that vertex are kind of facing. It is uh, what drives the way that the light reacts with the surface there. So that's essentially the concept of smoothing in a way. Uh, it's where every vertex has only one normal that is the average of the direction in which all of the polygons around it kind of point. Let's move on to cube number two then, and let's take a look at what's happening here. So in this particular instance, you can see that we have hard edges everywhere. So our surface, all of our polygons look like they are completely discontinuous. And certainly as I select it and we look at the normals that we have on this, you can see that all of these vertices suddenly now, as opposed to have only one normal that is pointing out to the average of the direction in which all the faces were actually pointing for. All these vertices actually all have now three different normals. So that's what I was talking about, uh, about the fact that a vertex can have multiple normals. Now, um, I suppose if you want to be a bit more technically correct about this, these vertices, uh, we wind up having one normal per vertex face, if you will, uh, which is essentially, if you imagine that these three faces, if these three faces were actually disconnected from each other, and so if I detach all of these uh, faces that I have here, or at least a few of them, you can see that essentially the normals they that we were looking at, they're kind of coming with the face on which they are attached. And finally, we have this third cube. And now this third cube, uh, in a, in a lot of cases, is the uh, the approach that I privilege when it comes to creating, uh, let's say, a low-res geometry. This kind of approach here, where you can see that around uh, each of the corners of the cube, I have actually gone in there and have added an extra edge loop. Now, there's cases where that's not preferable, but um, if you want to have a cube that will look like it it is uh, it it has some nice bevels, or a surface rather that looks like it has some nice bevels there. I typically like to create my low reses like these. And I'll show you examples later of what this looks like in practice in the context of a character, of course, so that you're not uh, only seeing a cube here. Um, but as you can see, um, even without having a normal map applied on these three surfaces, this 
kind of reasonably looks like a high res already, right? We have these nice bevels here, the way the light reacts with the surface is very nice. And uh, that is all due to the fact that I have added these extra loops around. And if we look at the normals, uh, perhaps you can kind of start to see what's going on there, right? If we look at the top polygon that we have here, all of its corners, the normals, all are pointing all directly vertically up. And same with this particular polygon here, you can see that all the normals are all pointing uh, towards the back, uh, I suppose, right now. Whereas all the vertices that are uh, more on the corner of the cube, I suppose, and on the edges of the cube, now these are uh, at a different angle there. And so, uh, since it is the normals of the vertices that controls how the light reacts with the surface, if we want to create a, a, a topology for either a character or for an object, that reacts really nicely with light, whether we have a normal map or not. But uh, as you'll see later, the less work a normal map has to do, the better usually the visual result will be in the end. And the, certainly the more robust it will be the changes. Uh, then when we're creating a lower res, really, what we're really doing in a lot of cases is that we are controlling the surface smoothing. How will the surface smooth? Uh, around the geometry, I suppose, of the object there, you know? Because, yeah, uh, that concept, again, that concept of uh, geometry being different from surface, uh, in this case, is very, very obvious to us once again, because these three have the same geometry. Now, this one has extra vertices, sure, but those, uh, but um, the silhouette of the object has not changed at all, right? Uh, and yet, these three objects, they look very, very different from a surfacing standpoint. And certainly the way that a normal map would react with the surface would also be very different there. So you work on a typical video game production, and at the start of the production, everyone's doing these fully clothed characters, and you're told, yeah, we will never see this character naked. It's never going to happen. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to deal with the body of the character. You can just clothe him, and life is great. And at some point, as production of the game goes on, well, at some point, someone's like, hey, actually, maybe we do want to see the character that is, uh, that has his torso there that is naked there. Maybe we do want to see the character not wear a shirt at some point within the game, right? Maybe we want to see a very nice steamy shower scene with the character there. And, uh, and then you're like, well, that kind of sucks because the head has been is a completely separate mesh, and the texture completely stops somewhere around the neck. And so you're kind of left to deal with that, you know? So you have a head that is completely separate from the body, or from a particular body that you could create, but somehow you have to connect these two things together in a way that will make it so that you won't be able to see the transition between these two things, right? So what do you do about that? Now, texture-wise, that is really a very interesting question to ask, and we won't necessarily delve into that right now, but what I did want to show you is what happens with the geometry itself, okay? So um, this isn't Jensen's body, uh, although it is his head. I've simply uh, taken uh, a different body. So this is the body that is on Outgang, for Outgang members. And um, I essentially took Jensen's head and I've just squished them together so that they are overlapping one on top of each other there. But uh, truth be told, they are separate meshes. There's no connection between these two. When you're working within a video game, and there has been a lot of skinning done, and there has been a lot of rigging done on a particular head like this, there is, you cannot do any sort of changes to the, to the topology afterward. You can't add vertices, you can't remove vertices, you can't merge vertices. You can't do any of that because it will completely break the skinning and the rigging that has been done previously there. So what do you do? Well, when you want to have a naked version of your character. Well, what you do is that you construct the body that the character will have in a very normal fashion. And you snap all of the vertices of the lores for the body onto the vertices of the lores of the head so that they are all completely overlapping but you do not 
weld them because you simply can't do that for the reasons we have outlined before. And so you wind up having a geometry that looks continuous, but your surface is not. Your surface is clearly broken because there is the equivalent of a hard edge here that goes all the way around the character there, right? So very, very simple trick. You want to fix that and you want to make sure that the mesh looks like it is completely continuous there. Super simple thing to do. You simply take all of the vertices that you have. And you take all the vertices that are on the border there between the two objects that you have. So let's go ahead and do that. Let me just select some edges here and let's convert that to a border selection. I will convert that to vertices. And as you can see, as I zoom in on this, the reason why the surface looks discontinuous is because each vertex has a normal that is slightly different for the head as it does for the body there. And that is why the surface looks like it is broken there. So you take all that you have here and you simply go to mesh display and you go to average. And in this case here, you simply use the default grouping threshold there, click apply. And now you have set to explicit all the normals that is connecting these two. Uh, these two objects there. But as you can see, because now the normals have been averaged between the head and the body, you have completely gotten rid of the separation between these two objects from a surfacing standpoint. And so although we're not going to get into uh, how do you make the texture seamless in this particular case between these two different objects, at the very least, this is how you make the surface be completely seamless. Even though technically in, in the end, these two surfaces will remain unwelded separate objects. Okay, let's delve deep into the topic of normal map and let's really understand how does a normal map modify the perceived surface that we have there. And let's really break that down because if you really understand that, you'll understand a lot of things like where is it that you can make changes to the uh, normal map and perhaps add details later on? What kind of changes uh, can you not do? What kind of changes are changes that will uh, really break the very fine relationship between a normal map and a particular surface that you have? These are my different objects uh, without a normal map. And these are the same objects with the normal map, right? The goal of a normal map is to take a surface of some kind and to make it look like a different surface in a way. That's kind of how you can really think about it, right? Um, now, the goal of a normal map and the role of it too is certainly to add a lot of details. You know, if we want to have a lot of details on the character that uh, are not expressed through the low res, uh, th through the low res itself, then the role of the normal map is also to come in there and add all of those details, right? If you want to have a lot of folds, a lot of textile fabric on a garment or something, that's where the normal map comes from. Uh, and that's usually what we think of. But not only is it there to add details, it is also there to, in a way, correct the low res and make the low res look like a different surface or make the surface of the low res look like a different surface. Um, and in this case, it's to take a surface that uh, by default, look like this here, which is our kind of spherical surfacing that we've looked at before, and make it look like a cube with some nice hard edges there and a few little bevels there. So that's really the two goals that the normal map has. So the one about details is usually fairly obvious and we don't necessarily have to talk too much about uh, the details of that. Sorry, that's a bad pun, but I can't resist a bad pun once in a while. Um, but it is certainly worth to talk about how is it that a normal map really corrects a surface? We really have to kind of understand that. Um, so um, if we think of this first cube that we were talking about, right, which the surface is really kind of more akin to a sphere, you know, this is kind of the surface of it, even though the geometry, as we have seen, the geometry itself is more, it's more like this. This is uh, our cube where uh, we have here 
So this is our low res geometry. And in white here is our low res, uh, let's say surface, right? Which is more spherical there. Okay, then on, what you're saying with this is that, okay, this is my low res and I want this to look like one of these very nice uh, high res cubes that we have here with, with this nice bevel and stuff, right? So if we kind of draw the, like the high res on this particular image that we have here. So our high res would be something like this. I'll just make it just slightly smaller than, than the low res so that it's easy to see, but technically they would probably be the same size, right? So this is our high res. What we're saying is that we want to take this particular low res surface that uh, looks like a, it is this kind of sphere right now. And we actually want this surface to look like the teal high res surface that we have here, right? And what a normal map does is that a normal map does not move vertices. It simply changes the, or the perceived orientation of a surface. The goal of a normal map, okay, is to take a surface uh, for which at a particular point, you know, like at a particular point of, of your surface, let's say we take this point here. On this particular point, the normal of the low res would be looking kind of like this. But what I want, because I want my low res to look like this very nice uh, cube that is very high res there, I actually want the normal at this particular point to actually be like this, right? We actually want to bring a normal up a little bit. Um, and that is what a normal map does. That is the goal of a normal map. The goal of a normal map is to take a particular normal uh, that you have at a particular point over your surface and to change it so that it looks like a different normal. Uh, so that it has, so that the normal has a different orientation there. So the goal of a normal map, okay, is to uh, encode the difference in orientation between these two points. Already so far, you know, like if you kind of think of the different cubes that we have, it's probably already very obvious to you that um, a normal map that works for, let's say, this particular cube, it should be obvious to you at this point that a normal map that has been baked to work with this particular cube to give me this particular high res will be a normal map that will look very different than a normal map that is baked over uh, a low res that looks like this or a low res that looks like that, right? And certainly, um, if we look at these different normal maps here, so if I take this particular cube and we look at what it looks like at, at its normal map, the, the normal map looks like this, there's all these different gradients going on left and right. Whereas if I take the normal map that is applied to this particular cube, and you take a look at it, it actually looks very different. All these surfaces, they look very flat. And there's just a little bit of information here uh, around the edges of the corners of the cube there. So uh, it should be very obvious to you already that uh, a normal map that is baked for a particular surface can only work for that particular surface. Uh, that should be very obvious, I hope. And that probably is the biggest takeaway so far. Like, if there is one thing I want you to remember, it really is that there. Um, another way, okay, uh, perhaps another way that I like to think about normal maps, perhaps, and really like, like what is the goal of a, of a normal map or how it works. And I think this, this may become a bit more intuitive for some of you, okay? Um, if we continue with this kind of idea here that we have, okay? Um, and let's just erase all these different normals that we have drawn. Um, another way you can kind of think about it, okay? Like, and, and maybe this may make more sense for some of you, perhaps. Um, the goal of a normal map, if we are to go from this particular low res surface normals, um, if you will, to the particular high res normals that are here, um, then what we need to bake is essentially the difference between these two states or these two different surfaces, if that makes sense. We need to bake the difference between these two states. So the place where uh, the, uh, the surface has the same kind of orientation, which would actually be kind of here, um, there is no difference between the normals of the high res and the normal of the low res. So in that case, you will have no values encoded here, right? But the further away, the more different these different surfaces are, the more information will have to be encoded within the 
null map there. So I kind of also kind of like to think about it. Like if we are baking this here, like our result, our normal map will actually look kind of something in a way kind of like this. You know, I kind of like to, to, to think about it like that from time to time. Our low res will kind of look, our normal map like will actually kind of wind up looking as if it's a surface that kind of looks like that in a way. Um, maybe that makes a bit more sense to you. And certainly, that is what the normal map looks like for the cube that is completely smooth. So let's open that here and let's take a look at it. This is how we get a normal map that looks like this. It's this kind of idea that everywhere, our normal map has to curve in an opposite direction from the normal, from the curvature that the, the, the surface has so that the addition of this inverted curvature will wind up giving a surface that looks completely flat, uh, a surface that essentially looks like this. So far, I mean, I hope all this makes uh, a certain amount of sense. Now, I kind of want to talk already about um, why is it that we are getting all these kind of little artifacts over this particular cube? Why is it that this is there? and why you should worry about that. Um, the simple reason why you're starting to see all these little artifacts over the surface is because we're asking the normal map to do a lot, okay? It has to do a lot of, it has to do a lot of work uh, so that the surface will wind up looking completely, completely, uh, so that the, the, the corners or the sides of the cube look completely flat. The surface has to do a lot of work to make it look like that, right? Our surface that's super spherical here, the normal map has to work quite hard at that. And because the normal map is composed of individual pixels, um, what happens is that at some point, those pixels, well, they have a certain size. They're not, you know, uh, they're not infinitely small. And so what happens is that all of these little artifacts that you're seeing is essentially the transition uh, from pixel to pixel on the normal map. That's kind of what it is. Uh, and so it's worth to think about that, okay? If you're making your normal map work really, really, really hard, there's a chance you'll start seeing all these little artifacts appear because you're making the surface work really, really, really hard, first of all. But second of all, okay, the thing I also want you to keep in mind, okay? Um, now, of course, you know, that's, that will vary based on texture uh, resolution. If I had baked this out as a 4K texture, then I would have, you know, smaller artifacts over the surface, these sorts of things. Um, but, you know, in, in games, we don't necessarily are able to afford textures that are uh, humongous all, of, all the time, right? So um, it's worth to keep in mind that, yeah, like, like this, uh, if you're not too careful about this, you may wind up uh, creating little visible artifacts um, later on there. Okay, but the second thing I wanted to mention about that, okay, is that uh, because the normal map uh, describes essentially the difference between the surface of the low res and the, uh, the high res that we have baked on top of it, it means that the moment that you actually, after you're done baking something, the moment that you actually do any sort of change to the surface of the low res, and I really want to emphasize the surface here, not necessarily the geometry, but the surface. The moment that you do any sort of changes to the surface of the low res, you are changing that relationship between the normal map and the low res, and you are breaking that, that relationship such that the low res, uh, and, or rather the normal map, will not correspond for that particular low res anymore, and your mesh will look really, really terrible afterward. And what does that look like? Well, it looks something like this, okay? Here's the same cube, but all I have done in here, and now this may probably sound a bit crazy for some of you, but uh, the only difference, okay, and you can see the surface, how the light kind of reacts with it. It's kind of looking kind of weird. It looks like a dented piece of uh, metal or something here and there and like elsewhere, okay? The only difference that I have done between these two cubes, okay, they are sharing the same texture right now. As you can see, if I turn this off, 
they're both actually uh, they're both they both have this kind of nice surfacing, this nice kind of sphere, uh, spherical surfacing to them. The only difference that I have done is that I have triangulated this particular cube in a different way. There is only the triangulation that is different between these two cubes. Literally, only changing the triangulation of the surface was enough to break that very delicate relationship between the low res and the normal map. And the more you're making your normal map work out, if you see what I mean, the more that relationship becomes very fragile and the less changes you can afford to do to the surface after baking uh, without having it have any sort of appreciable impact on the low res there or on the final result that you're going to get. Okay, so what do I mean by I have only changed the triangulation of the surface? Well, here's what it looks like. Let me display the triangles on these two meshes here. You can see the triangulation is different, right? Like, but they are in every other way the same surface. It's only that on this case here, I've gone in here and I flipped this triangle so that it is the other way. That is the only, only thing I have done. Uh, and I have that on some of the faces here. So I have that on the top face, on the side faces there. I have simply flipped the direction of the triangulation, and that was enough to break that very delicate relationship between the low res and, uh, and the normal map, such that now the normal map that has been baked here, that looks very, very good, now looks kind of wonky and dented there. And this is why I tell people, before you send something out to be baked, okay, you need to triangulate your mesh, okay? Super important, if you're gonna bake something out, okay, if you're like, okay, I wanna take this cube and I wanna bake a high res on top of it or a low res geometry of some kind for like a character or something, okay? Um, don't just export the quadded mesh that you have. Triangulate your mesh before you do so. Go to mesh here, I know it's very, very small right now, but it's uh, under the mesh menu. Just go in here, go, do a triangulate there. And what it's going to do is that it will simply um, convert all of the edges that you have. Uh, or rather, it will convert all of, all of the diagonals that you have all on your polygons. Uh, it will simply convert those two edges there so that your mesh winds up being fully triangulated. And by doing that, you are making sure that the triangulation will not change because the thing about 3D software is, is that uh, all 3D softwares um, all kind of deal with triangulation of a mesh in a slightly different way. If you take an object that has been triangulated within 3ds Max and you send it within Maya, there is no guarantee. And, and in fact, the only guarantee that you will have is that the triangulation will very likely wind up being different. A polygon that was like this will wind up being triangulated the other way, the triangulation will flip. And so different uh, 3D softwares, they simply calculate that diagonal, that separation there uh, that you have between the two triangles of a quad. Uh, different softwares will, will simply calculate in which position should that diagonal be in a slightly different way, which means that uh, something that has been baked perfectly and looks perfect within Maya, the moment that you throw it within an engine, the moment that you throw it within Marmoset, the moment that you throw it within 3ds Max, any package that you have, you run the risk of that package triangulated in, triangulating in a different way of that surface and breaking that very delicate relationship of the normal map that you may have baked um, previously there. So always triangulate your meshes prior to baking, please. But do not save it out, okay? Um, the thing that I also see students do is that they'll be like, oh, so I need to triangulate my mesh. So they'll take, um, you know, they'll take their character like this, they'll be like, okay, so let's try, let's triangulate all of that, let's let's do that here. And then they'll save this out, you know, and then they'll like give it to me as like, uh, as like an, um, as an assignment or like something or, or as part of that, okay? Um, do triangulate your mesh before you physically take your mesh and you export it out to be baked, but don't save this, okay? <laughs> because you wanna be able to continue to work on this 
without having all those triangles uh, visible everywhere, you know? Um, so do export it like that, but then do a control Z, undo the triangulation uh, before you save this out and, and, and or continue working on this particular scene um, in the future there. Now, mind you, um, whether you should triangulate your mesh and or lock your normals before exporting to the final target engine, that's another question entirely. Sometimes it makes sense to do so, uh, and sometimes it does not. If you're going to tessellate something, let's say within Unreal 4, um, it may not necessarily be a good idea to triangulate your mesh because that can kind of screw up the way that the tessellation works. So in that case, I would not necessarily triangulate the mesh before exporting it out. Um, but if you're not going to tessellate your mesh, then you also want to triangulate your mesh prior to exporting it out to the engine there. So I hope so far that you are becoming very aware that there's this very delicate balance between the LoRes and a normal map. And the more information there is encoded within a normal map, um, the less robust it will be to different changes that you could do over the surface. So if we move on from uh, what, uh, in certain cases, may be the worst case scenario you could ever uh, get, which is a mesh that is completely smoothed and there are no edge loops that have been added in different places to support the surfacing there. If we take a look at the context of this uh, second cube where all of the normals, uh, or rather where all the polygons, rather where all the edges had been turned to hard edges. So this particular one that's here, okay? And uh, we go back to Photoshop and we talk a little bit about what that means in terms of uh, uh, what is the impact of that on the normal map there. So the normal map in this particular case, okay, I'll just show it to you. Um, it doesn't look like this, rather it looks like this here. This is the normal map for the hardened cube. And you can see it looks very, very different. And why does it look different? Because the surface is very different. Even though the geometry is the same, the surfacing is very different, you know? so. If I draw down here, so low res surface, this is our smooth low res surface, right? But in the case of our hardened cube, then the low res surface is actually pretty much the same as the low res geometry. Uh, you know, they're both exactly the same. They're both completely, uh, they both have the exact same shape, right? And so, um, because the surface looks very different in this particular case, and because it is a lot closer to what the high res looks like in terms of normal orientation, it means that we really only have to encode within the normal map information around the corners. Really, the only thing that matters, really. Because everything else has the exact same orientation, and therefore there, there are no difference there that needs to be encoded for. And that is why in the normal map for this particular cube, the hard cube, all these surfaces here, they're all completely flat. There is no information encoded in there. And the only information that we have is what is encoded within these corners here to get these kind of little bevel that we have here. And so you can, probably already kind of imagine that this particular normal map would be a lot um, more robust to changes there, you know? If we, um, I mean, I suppose we could try something, right? Like, uh, and in fact, if you look at this particular scene, I have triangulated in a different way the cube that is in the back here, just the same as I have done uh, for this particular cube. I have changed the triangulation here of the polygons. Uh, but because there is no information here that uh, can really change, since the surface is completely flat, uh, the changing the triangulation on this particular cube, even though uh, I have done the same changes as I have done here, has no impact uh, on the uh, on the quality of the final result there. If you take a look here again. You can see that the triangulation goes in the opposite direction. 
But so because we're encoding less information within the normal map, it means that this particular normal map is more robust to changes. Uh, we can do more changes to the low res without necessarily breaking the relationship between the low res and the normal map to give us that high res there. So the takeaway isn't necessarily that you always want to have hard edges or that hard edges are always best. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, the takeaway is that as much as possible, a good low res has a surface that is as close as it possibly can be to the high res. That's really the takeaway because what you want is to essentially have to encode the least amount of information, uh, at least as it relates to surface correction, if you will, within your null map there. Now, you always want to have a lot of information as far as the details are concerned, right? But as we have said before, a neural map really has two purposes that are kind of merged within the same texture there. One of the purposes is to add the details that we want to have on the surface, um, the, all the little details that we wouldn't be able to capture in any other way. And the second thing that we want to do is to uh, simply uh, correct the low res to give us the appearance of that high res that we had there. So, so for, for that correction, um, purpose that a low res has, we essentially want to always, um, or that a normal map has, we, we want to be building low reses that will minimize as much as possible how much correction the normal map has to do. And that will allow us to build low reses that are more and more robust there. Uh, so if I was, let's say, baking a high res that was a sphere, as opposed to a cube, uh, I would be better off having everything be completely smooth like this as opposed to bake it like this because this is much further away from a sphere than what this one is. But considering the fact that I have baked uh, high reses that essentially look like this, these are all the high reses that I have baked on all of these. Well, you can see that our third and final cube, because I have added all those support edges there, and that everything is soft, we're getting the appearance of a high res. They're very, very close uh, in terms of surface smoothing, which means that the normal map has very little work to do to correct this particular low res uh, after our baking is done. And that is what is happening here. Uh, this is, uh, in this particular case, uh, I think the best result, even though it's heavier because we have all these extra vertices that we have seen, um, it, this is still preferable because you're really getting a really, really nice surface and you really don't have to put in a lot of information. Uh, and it is this one here. So if we take a look at this particular normal map, it looks like this. There is even less information in there. Or if I open it here, there is even less information in there than what we had for the hardened cube. And so this is, this is here the best result that we can get because uh, once again, this is the low res that is the closest to the high res in terms of surface smoothing prior to baking. And so this is the surface that we will be able to do uh, also the biggest amount of changes afterward to the topology uh, if it comes to that. Now, ideally, you never want to do that, but we could do it. Uh, whether you're trying either changing triangulation or if the triangulation is different between uh, the uh, where we have baked and where we are sending the model afterward, this particular normal map will be a lot more robust to that. It will resist uh, creating artifacts very easily as we have seen in other cases there. And so the last thing that's really worth to talk about then is, so why is this better than this? Because this is a lot heavier, of course. Uh, this third cube certainly is a lot heavier in terms of polygons. We have added a lot of vertices in there that we didn't have in the case of this one here. But actually, uh, have we added that many more vertices? So how many vertices do we have? So we have 56 vertices in here. And we said here that we have eight vertices on this. But it's eight vertices considering that each of these polygons has been, uh, or rather each of these vertices has been split in three uh, because of all the hard edges. So we're, we're winding up having 
uh, which is 24 vertices total. Whereas here we have 56. So it's about twice more vertices that we have. And for the increase in quality that we're getting out of it, spending twice as many vertices for this kind of surface is really, really, really worth it because it makes our normal map um, much more robust to changes there. Uh, and in fact, there is certainly a lot of cases where we could even, even have this as our low res without even having a normal map necessarily. If we like the bevels the way that they already like over the surface, we may not even need to bake a normal map on this. So there's a chance that we could even be able to say that. We could perhaps also have a smaller normal map to correct uh, the surface information. As you have seen, the more information has to be in the normal map to correct the surface, the higher res it needs to be so that you don't have a lot of artifacts that are kind of showing up. But in this case here, you could even perhaps even forego having a normal map entirely, right? So there's a lot of options that kind of show up there um, and uh, that make it so that perhaps even at a certain distance, you could get rid of the normal map completely and still have a surface that looks really, really good. So for me, even it, though this winds up being twice the vertex count, if you will, uh, or at least as far as the video card is concerned, as what we had here, uh, I still, in a lot of cases, would, would certainly much rather have this uh, kind of low res aspect where it is very, very close to the, what the high res smoothing is there. So that we wind up having, in the end, a normal map that has the least amount of information possible to correct for the smoothing of our surface. Let's talk a little bit more about those hard edges. And why is it that sometimes you don't necessarily want to use those uh, over a mesh, okay? And like, what is the major drawback then of using these hard edges there? Well, the biggest drawback of using hard edges like these, okay, is that when you have a hard edge somewhere, as you can see, because there is no more smoothing here, because this smoothing is discontinuous over the surface, it makes it so that um, you really can't have a texture somehow correct for that, okay? If I wanted to uh, bake this high res on top and have these nice, these very nice smooth bevels there, there's not really any way, or it, it's very, very, very hard and would have to be very, very precise to be able to bake this in a way that this edge here, this, this hard edge, completely disappears, is completely invisible. And uh, in a lot of cases, um, even using like very, uh, like the best baking values you could use, you're more or less always going to wind up always having those hard edges kind of, kind of appear over the surface. You know, you can't quite get rid of them completely there. They're not necessarily always very, very visible, but you always kind of wind up a little bit like that, or you can always kind of see a little bit where that hard edge was over the surface. Now, if you do want to use these hard edges, one way that you can mitigate this problem somewhat, um, sometimes get rid of it completely there, is by making sure that your UVs are actually completely split. Uh, and uh, wherever you have a hard edge, you need to have a UV split at that particular zone, which in this case here, crucially, I do not have because I wanted to have the uh, exact same UVs as I have on the other cubes and I wanted to show this to you. But wherever you have a hard edge, okay, if you want to mitigate this kind of problem with these kind of very little thin lines uh, appearing and you can't really quite get rid of them very easily there, what you need to do is you need to simply cut wherever you have a hard edge like this. Just make sure that you cut like that a little bit of space. It doesn't have to be a lot. Uh, and really just a few pixels usually is quite sufficient there. Um, you just want to cut out the faces. Uh, all the faces that are separated by hard edge. You want to have a UV seam at that particular zone. And that mitigates somewhat the issue of what we have uh, seen there of these kind of lines there. These would not be as prominent had I done that. Uh, but you'll still find that in a lot of cases that it's really, really hard to still kind of fully get rid of those. Uh, it's not always easy to do so. And even with the best baking and the best intentions, you sometimes always kind of get a little bit of a line that kind of shows up there that's kind of bothersome. Um, so that is one of the drawbacks. Now, sometimes that doesn't really matter. 
And sometimes that's even desirable to have a kind of separation there. Uh, if you're building a garment, let's say, um, I actually kind of like to have a hard edge that will separate, let's say, um, let's say I have a garment and I have a seam somewhere, right? You can, if you imagine yourself like a pair of jeans or something along those lines. Uh, if we kind of bring up something here, right? So if you say just like jeans, if you kind of imagine yourself like a pair of jeans of some kind and the seams on the side, sometimes it's actually kind of, kind of a good thing to have a hard edge sometimes that will separate you different panels because you really want to have that very, very nice sharp separation there. But my point is that they're sometimes good, they're sometimes bad. You kind of have to make a, a, a call um, like that, uh, sort of based upon experience, you know, like whether you think a hard edge here is appropriate or not. Um, but just know that, you know, they, they do have some limitations and they do force you at the minimum to split your UVs like that uh, so that you uh, reduce to the minimum the potential issues that you may have um, after baking. Okay, let's finish this by just uh, talking about everything that we have essentially talked about in the context of a character there. And uh, so this is a character from uh, Deus Ex. And um, I just want to put a few of the things that we have mentioned here in context so that uh, you have a good idea of how these different things are used. Uh, because I, I, uh, I do certainly think that everything so far has been perhaps interesting, but also certainly very abstract there. So in the context of a character, okay, um, what I usually recommend is that, especially if you have an organic surface of some kind, uh, whether it's a body, whether that's clothes, these sorts of things, what I usually recommend, okay, is that you really go in there and keep everything relatively smooth. And uh, if you take a look at the, the, the border of this particular jacket that the character is actually wearing here, you can see that certainly near the top, near the top of the collar here, I really went in there and I have added all these support edges uh, that we have talked about in the context of a cube there. And I have added them so that I would get this very nice bevel on the edges of the cloth there, but uh, without necessarily even needing to have a normal map there that really does the job of giving me the, these kind of nice bevels there. So I know that I, I'm gonna have a nice bevel here no matter what. Uh, it doesn't matter what I'm baking in the high res. Uh, I know that I can get some really, really nice bevels in these kind of places because I have controlled essentially the surface smoothing uh, using all of these support edges to really get this kind of nice round but also kind of soft border there. So that this really is my preferred way usually to um, finish the edges of a low res garment, especially when it is close to the face of a character and if it's going to be like really close to the screen, you know? Like, if you take a look at a character from this distance here, right, which is kind of what you more or less expect when you are in conversation with a character or something else, um, all these little bevels that I have, all this kind of softness that it gives us to the surfacing there, I think is very interesting. You can really perceive it, so it's really worth to spend the extra geometry there to really get that going there. But, um, you know, as we have also talked about, all of these support edges, they do uh, add a lot of vertices. They do have a certain... Uh, performance cost in the end um, because we are adding more geometry there than if we had, let's say, or if we finished the edges of our garment using hard edges there, right? So, uh, because these are still more expensive, I don't necessarily either want to have this kind of approach of adding these support edges. I don't necessarily want to do that everywhere either because uh, it does cost a lot in terms of uh, vertices to do that. And so uh, for me, it's like, I will usually do this kind of approach for anything that is uh, of a higher importance over the character. So if I know that there's gonna be a close up in some way, shape or form of something related to the character, and often this is what happens with the portrait of a character when you're in a conversation, or even if you're in first person, if you get very close to a character or something else there, I wanna really spend the polygons here, but I don't necessarily want to spend as many polygons elsewhere where I know that uh, you will always kind of see these from further away, which is why, like, um, if you look at the 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 border, let's say, of uh, let's say the 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 sort of pouches here that are on the trench coat there, right? Uh, these are lower uh, on the on the frame. You don't 
you probably won't really see these uh, uh, as a close-up. And so for me, the next best way to finish the edges of a garment, of Laura's garment really, is really simply to have a hard edge here. You know, as we have talked about, it's kind of hard sometimes to make it disappear. It may wind up having a slight amount of artifacting over the surface there, but it is more um, optimal perhaps in terms of polygon or in terms of vertex use than what we had over the collar there. Uh, it's also a bit simpler to model, so I kind of like it there. So I, like, I, I tend to finish the edges of a garment that are further away from the frame of a camera. I expect the player to be able to see the character at. Um, I like to finish those using hard edges because they do wind up being uh, slightly cheaper there, at least in terms of geometry.